Please turn with me to the book of Daniel, the ninth chapter. Daniel begins in approximately 605 B.C. This is when Nebuchadnezzar doesn't destroy Jerusalem, but he comes and sacks it. Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan Babylonian king. And he takes captive Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, several others. Basically taking the youngest, the best, the brightest. Captive, exiled. This was a common practice. The Assyrians had done it. The Babylonians did it. You take the, the strongest from a group of people you've just conquered, you basically gut their leadership. They're less likely to rebel. And so this was done. But it didn't stop those in Judah from, from rebelling. And so finally in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar comes and destroys Jerusalem and destroys it completely. Destroys the temple that Solomon had built, ransacks the nation, plunders it completely, even more so than he had done 19 years earlier. And Daniel, being one of the exiles, does his ministry from Babylon. And so as you read the book of Daniel, you have to be aware and understand that this is a, a, a Jewish man living in exile, a Jewish man whose entire ministry takes place in exile. And he's a man of great integrity, great excellence, great skill, great ability, but great spiritual fervor and maturity. And we will pick it up in the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel. And I believe that this is something that is of importance to us today because it has great relevance for where we are uh, somewhere along God's time, timeline and in the nation in which we live. The United States isn't very old as far as nations are concerned. We've not been around that long as far as nations are concerned. A very unique nation built and based upon ideals and principles that came out of the scripture. Doesn't mean that the United States has lived up to those ideals very well, but it was founded upon those ideals. And because it was founded upon those ideals, we were held to a higher standard of judgment in many ways, to whom much is given, much is expected. Abraham Lincoln thought that the Civil War was God's judgment upon the nation for the horrific and horrible sin of slavery. I certainly don't disagree with that. Because the founding ideals and the founding principles were of scriptural origin, the people should have known better and should have governed themselves accordingly. And when they refused to do it, when they chose not to do it, Horrible, horrible consequences took place. And the cost of freedom didn't end in 1865. It took a lot longer, and in many ways it's still gut-wrenchingly manifesting the struggle. And human dignity and human frailty are really tragic tensions on a line of life. On the one hand, we, we, we are to treat one another with the dignity of the fact that we're all created in the image of God. On the other hand, we're very frail. We don't live very long. We're susceptible to things quite easily. Not only does our bodies fail, our emotions fail. Our, our, our determination fails. Our sense of right and wrong gets muddied and, and compromised and all sorts of things. And so it takes a sense of divine discipline to walk in the ways of God, of divine prudence, of divine understanding that as a single human being founded with Jesus Christ in your heart, found rather with Jesus Christ in your heart, not only do you have great responsibility, because you do, but you have great influence. And these two go together. There's a synergy with them. For every time influence comes, responsibility goes with it. You cannot have one without the other. You cannot have influence without being responsible for that. And you cannot have responsibility without having influence with you. It's just the way it is. And so when the Lord says things to you and I that we're called to be salt and light, He's telling us you have influence and you have responsibility. When He says the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells within you, He's telling you that you have influence and you have responsibility. 
When he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. He's telling you, you have great influence and great responsibility. One of the tragedies of, of modern Americanism, of modern, of modern uh, American Christianity, for lack of a better term, is that, is that we tend to think that we are isolated from. And we're not. We're not. And what we do as individuals and what we do corporately has great impact in the spiritual realm and has great impact in society, even if we don't think it does. Again, this is why I take us back to Daniel this morning. Daniel was one man whose ministry spanned several decades. He was one man living in exile. And yet his influence travels down the corridors of time, 2,500 years to us. One man living not in his home, praying for his nation, praying for the nation in which he was exiled to, praying that God would use and raise up and touch. One guy had profound influence. And so Daniel 9 is a prayer of intercession. As I said to you earlier, the book of Daniel begins around 605 B.C. It concludes around 530 B.C. It's a long time of ministry. Where we pick it up is approximately 536 B.C. So it's 69 to 70 years after Daniel's been taken into exile. So by now he's an old man. By now he's lived 70 years of ministry. By now he's gone through the lion's den. By now his buddies Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had gone through the fiery furnace. By now, he's done all of these things. And we pick it up in chapter 9, and Daniel says, In the first year of Darius, which is about 536 B.C., who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the Scriptures. Say that with me, please. I, Daniel, understood from the Scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Stop there for a moment. This began in 605, the desolation. This is now 536 B.C. The numbers go backwards, okay? <laughs> they descend, all right? So this is 69 years later. So now Daniel, knowing what the Word of God said, that 70 years were appointed, he begins to pray. He didn't offer this prayer 10 years earlier. He didn't offer it 20 years earlier. He didn't offer it 50 years earlier. He didn't offer it in 586 B.C. He offered it now. Because he knew where he was on God's timeline. He knew where he was on God's timeline because he knew the word of God. I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. Father, help us to understand your word today in Christ's name. Amen. So I turned to the Lord. So I turned to the Lord. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him. Why did Daniel turn to the Lord? Why must we turn to the Lord? Because God is good always. Because God's promises are true 
always. Because his love is present always. Because his word is living and active always. And because the promise of God is not for you to party to, the promise of God is for you to pray in. Daniel stood on the promise. That's number one in your notes. Daniel stood on the promise. Too many of us think that because God gives a promise, that means we get to sit back and applaud. Because God gives a promise, we get to have good church. Because God gives a promise, that voids us of our responsibility. Just the opposite. I would like you to learn a synonym. And that is, whenever you see in the Bible the promise of God, put within that, if you, I'm not, I don't know if it's right to say to substitute it, but it, it can be substituted. Whenever you see the word promise, put the word instruction. The promise of God is the instruction of God. The promise of God to you is the instruction of God to you. Daniel looks at this and he says, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I had a meal celebrating the good news that that clock was running out. No. So I had a big party at synagogue. No. So I got my tambourine out and shouted. Maybe. What did he do? I pleaded with him in prayer. I pleaded with him. In petition, I pleaded with him in fasting. I pleaded with him in sackcloth. I uh, sackcloth. I pleaded with him in ashes. The same principle goes throughout the Scripture. First Kings chapter eighteen. After after three and a half years of drought, at the word of the Lord to the prophet Elijah, the Lord says to Elijah, "I'm going to send rain." That's the promise. Elijah does not then just go, oh, good. He meets up with Ahab. They have a big argument, a debate. You have the whole fire out of heaven on the altar taking taking place. You have him him, uh, 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 dealing with the prophet, the false prophets of Baal. Then after fire falls from heaven, God never promised fire. He promised rain. After all that takes place, then Elijah goes up onto the mount and begins to pray. And he doesn't pray once, he doesn't pray twice, he doesn't pray three times, he doesn't pray four times, he doesn't pray five times, he doesn't pray six times, he prays seven times. And on the seventh time, his servant says, there's a cloud the size of a man's hand rising on the horizon. And Elijah says, that's good enough, we're good. And the rain came. When God gives a promise, there's an expectation that you and I will agree with heaven concerning the purposes of God. For the promise of God and the purpose of God always go hand in hand. And so so Daniel knew that the promise meant something because he knew the word of God. You say, well, what what passage is he reading? He Daniel was reading the same passage that is all over Christian media today. Everybody loves this passage, but few people have read it because they like one verse in it. Here's the passage that Daniel read that you have read. But I want you to consider how Daniel responded compared to how we tend to respond. Jeremiah 29, ever heard of that? Everybody loves Jeremiah 29, 11. Oh, I love Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Glory to God. I love Jeremiah 29, 11. 
Let's read it. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon. That, that's the context. I got good plans for you, but I'm sending you guys out for three quarters of a century. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good, what? Promise. Promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Verse 12. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Why was Daniel praying the way he was praying? Why was he pleading? Why was he repenting? Why was he wearing sackcloth? Why was he heaping ashes upon his head? Because he knew what Jeremiah said. The promise of God wasn't a bumper sticker for him. It wasn't a meme to go on his Facebook page. It was something that required his intercession. He needed to seek the face of God. He needed to seek the Lord. He needed to call upon the Lord. And he needed to get to a place where he was doing it with his whole heart. You see, beloved, prayer, godly prayer, righteous prayer, effective prayer, always begins with the word of God. It is the word of God that is alive and powerful, Hebrews says. It's the word of God that is sharper than a double-edged sword. It's the word of God that divides between soul and spirit. It's the word of God that divides between joint and marrow. It is the word of God that exposes my innermost thoughts. You see, to say I'm going to seek the Lord with a whole heart is a very hard thing. Because you don't know your whole heart. We all got blind spots. And some of us have blind spots that are mile wide. You don't know your whole heart. So why does Daniel go with intercession in sackcloth and ashes and all of these things? Because he knows he doesn't know his whole heart. He needs God to expose his whole heart so he could offer that to the Lord so that the Lord's promise could be fulfilled in his life and in his nation. Listen to me carefully, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not mad at anybody today, so just, but just hear me. Okay, sometimes I preach like I'm mad. I'm not mad. Not remotely. I just want you to have a life that honors the Lord and is fulfilling for you. And too many of us pray out of our own word instead of out of the word. If you are unwilling to put the word of God in your heart, you will not have an effective prayer life. Any person of deep prayer is a person of deep word. They are in the word, not just occasionally, not even just daily, but they find themselves looking to the word throughout the day. Isaiah, the Lord prophesied, when I declare something, my word will go out and not return to me empty, but it will do what I wanted. It will accomplish what I determined. So Daniel stood on the promise, therefore, number two, he could pray. Because he stood on the promise, he could pray. Because he stood on the promise, he could pray. Isaiah 55, verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. John Wesley said, God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a five minutes here reading the rest of Daniel's prayer. I would invite you to look at this from the context of Daniel's humility, 
his passion, his identificational repentance, even though Daniel was probably the most righteous man in that century. He identifies with the sins of his fathers and of his brothers. He doesn't say they sinned. He said we sinned. In all this, Daniel calls on the name of the Lord. Daniel 9, 2. Let's begin. I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. O oh Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands. We, everybody say we. We, we say it one more time. We. we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The men of Judah and people of Jerusalem, all Israel, both near and far, and all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. O oh Lord, we and our kings, our princes, our fathers are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving even though we have rebelled against him. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that God's character is greater than our wickedness? Aren't you glad that God's character is greater than our wickedness? Verse 10. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us great disaster. In other words, beloved, when wickedness reigns, God's not the one to blame. He told you it would be like that. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. If there is ever a verse of scripture that is applicable to 2017 America, it is that verse. All this is going on, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord, not by praying, but by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. Verse 14. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we've not obeyed him. Now, O Lord our God, I love that verse, by the way, now, you know what's beautiful about it? It's not that you get to tell God what to do, because you don't. It's that Daniel knew where he was in the scripture and on God's timeline. So when he says now, he's simply agreeing with heaven. When he says now, he's simply saying amen. When he says now, he's simply saying, Lord, you promised it, therefore bring it. This is the power of effective prayer. This is the power of a person who prays the word. The word of God says it, therefore I will pray it. Now, O oh Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand 
and who made yourself a name that endures to this day. We have sinned. We have done wrong. Oh, Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins, the iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Daniel knew what he was and he knew what he wasn't. He knew he was a child of God, but he knew he was a sinner. He knew, however, that God was great in love. God was great in mercy. God was righteous and God was merciful. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Oh, Lord, listen. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, hear and act for your sake. Oh, my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. You are a kingdom of priests. What Daniel did right there is priestly intercession. He stood before God on behalf of the people. And he stood before the people on behalf of God. We think of Daniel as a prophet, and rightly so. And a prophet speaks the heart and mind of God. But in this moment, in this intercession, he was behaving as a priest. He was interceding on behalf. This is your calling. This is my calling. This is our calling. This is who we are. We can pray this prayer. Lord, hear us. Lord, forgive. Lord, act. Please don't delay because of your name, because of your purposes. Oh, Lord, God, heal our land. Prayer is not simply preparation for the work. In a very real way, it is the work. And because Daniel stood on the promise, and because Daniel could pray with passion, humility, and power, he could also receive the revelation of not only God's past purposes, but of God's future purpose. Number three in your notes, he could see the purpose of God. You see, beloved, only the people of God can answer the call of God to intercession. Only the people of God can be salt and light to our nation. And only through the word of God and spirit-led intercession can the people of God receive revelation of the purposes of God in the moment and what God wants to do next. Let me give you an example here back in our text. Verse 20. While I was speaking and praying. So what's he doing? Remember? Hey, it's been 69 years. Jeremiah said, 70, I need to go to prayer. But I got to seek God with my whole heart because partial heart won't do. So I'm going to repent and I'm going to get in sackcloth and ashes because I need the Lord to search me, oh God. As David said, see if there's any wicked way within me. I need the Lord. And now I'm going to pray, and I'm going to pray on behalf of my nation. I'm not just going to pray on behalf of my brothers scattered, but he did. I'm not just going to pray on behalf of my brothers in Babylon, and he did. I'm going to pray upon the, for those who, are, who have been left and for the devastation that is there. And I'm going to pray not only about what is, but about what was. My fathers, my forefathers, and those coming after, before me, and now those coming next. Look at what happens. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill. While I was still in prayer. I want you to see this. While I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. 
Now, I'll tell you what, if that won't wake you up, nothing will. Amen. Gabriel doesn't do a whole lot that we know of in the scripture. He, he visits occasionally, and when he does, it's always a big deal. Right? You know, we got, got, got Christmas coming up. Gabriel's involved in that. Gabriel comes to me in swift flight. When? While I'm praying. What's he do? Verse 22. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come. When did Daniel pray? Lord, now. Lord, now. Lord, now. Gabriel comes. I have now come to give you insight and understanding. Oh, beloved, how desperately we need insight and understanding. But if we're not going to be men and women of the word, there's no insight coming. If we're not going to be men and women of prayer, there's no understanding coming. But if we'll get into the word and we'll get into prayer, you'll find fresh revelation coming. Not new revelation, fresh revelation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There ain't no new Bible being written, okay? When someone starts telling me stuff like that, I go, no, 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 no. But when they can take me to the Word and show me something I've not seen before, that's fresh revelation. Daniel, I've now to give, come to give you insight and understanding. Look at verse 23. As soon as you began to pray. Hallelujah. As soon as you began to pray. As soon as you began to pray, an answer was given which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. Now, he goes into it quite extensively. We won't today. We're out of time. But look at verse 24. Seventy-sevens. Oh, I love the poetry of God. I used to see the Lord as this great warrior king, and he is. But the experiences of my life the last five years have told me that the Lord's a great poet king. I love the poetry of God. Daniel knew 70. 70. There were 70 years. Okay. Is that it? 70, number of completion, all that. Is that it? And the Lord says, oh, Daniel, I got more planned than you know about. <laughs> I got a whole lot more going on. What you think is the end and the culmination is only just the beginning. I got 77s decreed for your people. I got more than you thought. I got more than you imagined. I got more than you asked for. I'm a God of milk and honey. No one needs honey, but I got more than just milk for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city. To do what? Now he's revealing the purposes of God for humanity. To finish transgression. To put an end to sin. Oh, don't you, can't you just get excited about that? That the Lord's purposes are to finish transgression and put an end to sin. But he doesn't just do it by strict judgment because none of us could stand then. So how does he do it? To atone for wickedness. To bring in everlasting righteousness. To seal up vision and prophecy. And to anoint the most holy, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Notice the poetry. Daniel knew 70 years were assigned for judgment and completed, so he's asking the Lord, and God gives him more and reveals more than Daniel could have imagined. Daniel was looking back 70 years, and the Lord's looking out 70 times 7. Church, it's not too late for our country. It's not too late for our city. It's not too late for San Francisco. It's not too late for the Bay Area. It's not too late for California. It's not too late for America. It's not too late for Washington, D.C. It's not too late for New York and Chicago and all the great cities of our land and all the great towns and villages of our nation. It's not too late for Europe. It's not too late for the Middle East. It's not too late for Asia. It's not too late for Australia. You know why? Because God's purposes are to bring about redemption. Hallelujah. If it were over... 
we'd all be out of here. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's not over. But it is time to pray. It's not too late for our children. It's not too late for our grandchildren. The Lord God is merciful and the Lord God is mighty. He would have spared Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of ten righteous people. God wants to deliver. God wants to save. God wants to heal our land. But he looks for a man. He looks for a woman. He looks for someone who will stand in the gap. In the case of Ezekiel, he said in Ezekiel 22, 30, I looked for one man and couldn't find one. All I needed was one to agree with me. In the case of Daniel, he found one. May you be that one. May we be that one. May we be those who believe that God can do immeasurably more, Ephesians 3.20, than all that we could ask or imagine. May we be that one who believes the prophecy of Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14, that the earth will be filled. The earth will be filled. The earth will be filled. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. May we be those who say, Lord, we've heard of your fame. We stand in awe of your deeds. Renew them in our day, in our time, make them known, and in wrath, remember mercy. You were born here. I don't know what nation you were born in, but you were born here in this hour, in this time. And God puts you here right now. Some of you may be saying, oh, I wish I was born in a different time, or I wish I was born in a different era, or I wish I was born in a different place, or I wish I, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. Would you knock that off? I mean, seriously, in the name of the Lord, would you knock that off? You live where God has you to live. You live when God has you to live, and you live for his purposes. You are here now because God needs you here now. I'm sure Daniel went around Babylon going, boy, I wish I'd lived 100 years earlier. Actually, I, think, I don't think he did at all. I think he knew he was where God wanted him. Quit sinning the sin of idolatry that says you know better than God does. You don't. So we're here now. So now we're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. And I can't help but believe God's raising up congregations around to pray. So those that are on live stream, because I'm going to be calling the congregation forward, I will, will be cutting this off. It's just a way of me protecting the privacy of brothers and sisters in the house. But as I'm inviting those here to pray, I invite you to pray. Make an altar wherever you are and call on the name of the Lord because God's not done. God's not done. I was raised in the Jesus movement of the 70s. We expected the Lord to return right now. You remember all that? And some of us remember when there was 88 reasons why he had to return in 88. Listen to me. I believe the Lord could return today. But until he does, we must work. Jesus said the night's coming when no one can work. So while it's day, we must do the work of the Lord. And the work of the Lord begins in his word. It begins in prayer. And then the revelation comes and we be about his business. So the worship team is going to be leading us in Hear Us From Heaven. But I, I'm going to start with a prayer song. I, I don't know how this is going to show up on the video, but it's just a simple, it's very old song. I didn't even want to ask Larry to, to learn it because it's just an old song. It comes out of that era. But it's one of confession and prayer. And so I've asked them to cut off the live stream, so it's just us. 
Would you please stand with me?